Well, they said that one day, if man continued in his way, he said, the creator would annihilate this world. Hollywood knows man's destroying the earth. You have no idea what's coming. And apparently I exploited this woman who works at Fox. And apparently video games cause murder. Well, I think video games is a bigger problem than, than, uh, than guns. And new federal standards will fix education. As teachers, we're on the front lines. And we support Common Core. And income inequality is destroying America. I believe this is the defining challenge of our time. And the New York Times is not liberal. The news pages uh, are not ideological. Popular nonsense. That's our show today. And now, John Stossel. Since we titled this show Popular Nonsense, we start with Hollywood, which lives or dies based on popularity. Recently, a new Godzilla movie came out. We awakened something. Well, there's nuclear tests in the Pacific. Not tests. They were trying to kill it. And the director's politics are killing me. I planned to see Godzilla, but then I read the director said the movie is really about global warming. How abusive the planet. We deserved it in a way. Give me a break. Now, Hollywood makes some wonderful movies with useful messages. Some. The Hunger Games shows an individual resisting a powerful central government that uses coercion to control people. Dallas Buyers Club promotes entrepreneurs and opposes overbearing FDA rules. The new Superman movie shows Clark Kent fighting the government's surveillance apparatus. All three movies are Liberty and Film Award winners. So good for them. But Hollywood usually doesn't get it right. And it's rare when an actor sees popular nonsense and has the nerve to speak out about it, like the character Dion does in the movie and TV show Clueless. Who cares? It's irrelevant to our lives. That was Stacey Dash. Here she is, 19 years later, a new Fox contributor. <laughs> what have you learned since then? That Hollywood is um, very opinionated. As long as they're aligned with the opinions of the liberals in Hollywood, then it's okay. But if you have a different one, no, not so okay. <laughs> well, also joining us is Christian Toto. He's movie critic for Breitbart.com. And you call Hollywood a bubble society? And you look at the greatest Gallup poll, it said that global warming kind of ranks low on the priority list, and yet it pops up again and again in movies. Sometimes it's a major theme. Sometimes a director is obsessed with it. Other times it sort of sneaks in, there might be a reference or two, but uh, it's amazing that, it, that something that's not that important to the voters in a way flowers into these productions and sometimes it powers an entire movie. But global warming is a better movie topic. It's, I can see it might not just be politics, mm -hmm. it's good movie making. When it's done with especially global warming, it's kind of a lecture and I think a lecture doesn't really play well. Well, this movie Noah isn't exactly a lecture, uh, but I thought it was a religious story. Somehow, it's, <laughs> the movie is a global warming story. Apparently. You got it all wrong. The, the, you, you missed out the source material. The, the largest part. theme of the film, environmentalism. Right. I, I think maybe the GOD the market... might have come into play as well, but apparently not. <laughs> Stacy, you say it would have been a smarter movie if they'd made it about good, evil, devotion, forgiveness, redemption. Had they aligned it more with the biblical story of Noah, then maybe they would have gotten a larger audience, more eyeballs, more money. <laughs> uh, they would have been more successful. But it's not, religion is not in their hearts. Fear of global warming is. I, I mentioned the Godzilla movie yeah. earlier. Let's play another clip. What's really happening is that you're hiding something out there and it is going to send us back to the Stone Age. This is where you lose me. I mean, it's about giant lizards fighting. If we are trying to find deeper meaning in that, then we all just need to chill out. It would be nice if movie makers got important issues right, because people do believe what they see in movies. Uh, well, they don't think Godzilla was real. <laughs> or maybe people do, because Jimmy <laughs> Kimmel decided to ask people this. Considering Godzilla is based on a true story of the giant lizard attack on Tokyo that killed more than 100,000 people, 
1954. Do you think it's wrong that Hollywood glamorizes this for entertainment? Kind of like they're glamorizing their debt. Do you support the bill before Congress that would allocate $600 million to equip the U.S. Navy with anti-reptile capabilities? Yes. How come? Because anything that we can do to protect our nation, we got to do. Do you believe these creatures are caused by global warming? Actually, I do. Like global warming, uh, pollution, you know, we don't know. There's so many mysteries under the sea. Ah, the power of Hollywood. We, we asked Christian to give us more examples <laughs> of popular nonsense from recent movies. He mentioned Snowpiercer. Chaos. Disorder. This is death. This movie will open in America this month. The concept is that an attempt to stop global warming again has created a new ice age. And this one actually segues beautifully from global warming into class warfare. So you kind of come for the global warming alarmism. A twofer. You get a twofer, absolutely. And so the day after tomorrow, same theme, an ice age exactly. out of global warming. Yeah, so it's, it's not, a, it's not, these are not random events. There's a definite theme here that we're seeing over and again. So uh, I, we'll see how this one plays at the box office, but could scare a few people away. Our final movie tonight is Elysium. It's about a future where machines do great things like curing cancer. Cancer cells removed. Christian, what's wrong with that? Well, I love the fact that there's a future where you can pop into a bed on this machine and actually get all the things that are wrong with you cured. But it talks about the class warfare the, between the rich and the poor. And when you have a movie with stars like Jodie Foster and Matt Damon, who are well-to-do, I think we can safely say, I don't know, that, that kind of lecture might rub some people the wrong way. It becomes Maybe. a class warfare movie where the rich get the cancer treatment and the right. poor suffer. Stacy, you, you told our producer you'd like to see a disaster movie about Obamacare. <laughs> well, you know, I think Elysium pretty much did that well. You, you have this magical spaceship, right, where there's a magical bed that heals everything and everything's bright and shiny and beautiful. Meanwhile, the rest of the populace live in a socialistic society run by robots. Uh, to me, it's a wake-up call. <laughs> really. <laughs> We're, we may be heading in that direction. Well, before we let you both go, I want to <laughs> ask you about these billboards that have been put up in Hollywood, which appear to be part of a campaign to discourage divorce. Billboards from the Society for the Prevention of Celebrity, Celebrity Divorce. They say things like, when you unconsciously uncouple, millions unconsciously uncouple too. Uh, consciously uncouple is a reference to Gwyneth Paltrow and Chris Martin? Yes, that's pop culture. That term is As now part of our conversation. Well, all of us mm -hmm. thought the billboards were a sincere campaign to discourage divorce, but it turns out they're a promo for an upcoming reality show called Marriage Boot Camp. <laughs> Five of television's most watched couples. That's it. We are out of here. Will fix their broken relationships the only way they know how on camera and in the end they'll have to make the ultimate choice make a decision on whether to stay with this person or move on yeah yuck now stacy that looks stupid and gross to me but the idea of getting couples to <laughs> talk about their differences i suppose that, that's not popular nonsense it might be useful i think that's a very good idea i just don't know that seeing a billboard telling you that you know you should not get divorced would help any. I've been divorced three times and I'm pretty sure that the billboard would not have stopped me. Thank you, Stacy and Christian. <laughs> now, more popular nonsense. We expect it from Hollywood, but I don't expect it from my daily newspaper. But I get it all the time in this one, the New York Times. On this particular day when the United States and Nigeria announced they'd agreed to share intelligence to try to find those kidnapped schoolgirls, that story merited one tiny paragraph on the bottom of page 10. But global warming got three huge scare stories. The big melt accelerates. Climate issues move to four in California. And creepiest of all, how El Nino might shift people's views on global warming. That article says El Nino could bring devastating droughts or heavy rains. The accompanying wave of headlines might energize climate change activists and refocus attention on the climate change heading into the presidential election. It's like they're cheering on destruction. These people can't possibly call themselves objective journalists, can they? 
and yet they do. Listen to this navel-gazing interview. A woman from CNN says to a Times public editor, the loudest criticism that we often hear about the New York Times is that it has a liberal bias. Does it? It's an urban paper. It's a New York City paper. I mean, that's a reasonable criticism, I think. So it is a yes. It's a modified yes with a lot of nuance in it. Please, there's not much nuance in this thing. And listen to what the recently fired editor of the Times said in response to that question. Of course, she won't come on this show, but she allowed actress Marlo Thomas to ask her about conservatives calling the Times excessively liberal. I think that the, the news pages uh, are not ideological. Opinion is the province of our editorial and op-ed page. Give me a break. The news pages are ideological, too. For a year, Bill Crystal was an op-ed columnist for the Times. Bill, did you open any of their minds? No, I don't think so. You had a one-year run. I mean, what, what was your experience that they just want? They, they don't overtly try to sell a point of view. They just think everybody ought to think their way because everybody around them does. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I mean, personally, I was treated professionally. I emailed in my column. We fact-checked it. I it came out the next day. And it was a perfectly acceptable professional relationship. I, um, that, that was that. But in terms of the Times, I think the most important thing, thing to understand is, yeah, they're blinkered, more than, almost more than biased. The New York Times is the house organ of contemporary American liberalism. And they see the issues, they focus on the issues that American liberals focus and obsess on, like global warming, as you were saying. They report things from a certain point of view. They rarely sit around and say, let's distort the facts. They just see, they only see some of the facts. And they don't know anyone who doesn't agree with them. And that's a huge problem. They're really in a bubble in a way that I honestly think those who work at Fox News, for example, aren't. If you work at Fox News, you spend a lot of time being told, hey, you're not being fair, really fair and balanced. What about this? What about that? So you're sensitive to the counter arguments. But look, the Times isn't tied to a free country. The Times is a private entity. They're entitled to publish what they want. They, but they shouldn't kid themselves, and we shouldn't give them any credibility as to their being an objective news organ. Like Hollywood, they're in, they're in that same bubble. And they used to really matter. Now, at least, we have all these other alternatives. No, the number of people who are reading a story on page 16 are a couple hundred thousand. Bill O'Reilly's getting, with his repeats, up to five million. You'd think they wouldn't matter, except that the, the media copy the Times. But even there, they matter much less. When I came to Washington, there were three networks that had evening news shows. So if the Times led with something, it would often be on ABC, CBS, NBC that night. It was much, much worse 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, there was no John Stossel here on Fox and no, no a heck of a lot of other people, incidentally, uh, trying to provide balance and, and no choice. You couldn't go online in the morning and read Charles Crowdhammer's column or someone else or some article from, you know, the Weekly Standard or National Review or whatever. You were limited to what they chose to give you. And it's much better now. Finally, since you run a political magazine, I assume you still subscribe to the Times? No, no. I just read <laughs> stuff online and, and, and evade the paywall when it comes down. When I, and the rare moments when I want to read more articles in a month than they give you free. <laughs> Thank you, Bill Crystal. I, I still hope they'll get smarter, so I'll keep reading this and yelling, give me a break. In fact, that's tonight's hashtag. To keep this conversation going on Facebook or Twitter, use this to let people know what you think. Coming up, evil video games. They teach kids to be violent. That's what I'm told. Also, how I exploited this woman. More popular nonsense next. America's debating the minimum wage. Should it be raised from the current $7.25 an hour? Should it be 15 an hour, as Seattle just decreed? I say it should be zero dollars an hour. The minimum should be whatever a worker wants to accept. But that's illegal in America. Wait, how could it be illegal? I've had hundreds of employees whom I paid zero dollars. They were interns. They worked for a summer in order to learn something about journalism. Some went on to careers at newspapers and TV stations. Do you know this New York business anchor woman, Jolene Kent? Her first TV job was working as an intern for me when she was in college. I paid her nothing. Why wasn't I arrested? 
Why weren't ABC, CBS, and Fox prosecuted for allowing me and others to use interns? Because for years, government ignored the old rules imposed by the Department of Labor. People understood that internships can be educational, so lots of schools had deals with employers where we got to try people out and students got experience. Win, win. But then came the Obama administration. His bureaucrats said unpaid internships are legal only if an employer gets no immediate advantage from the intern. It's actually even better if they may be impeded. Sheesh, who wants that? Of course I got an advantage from my interns. That's why I employed them. We both benefited, but that appears to be over. Recently, some interns sued their employers, their former employers. Charlie Rose uh, not long ago forked over a quarter of a million dollars after an intern sued, saying her mom, an employment lawyer, explained her unpaid internship was unethical. Word spread, unpaid internships are vanishing. This week, the company behind Vogue, Vanity Fair, and several other quintessential magazines ended their internship programs. Employers lose and students lose. I say that's awful, but Raphael Pope Sussman says it's good. You wrote in the New York Times, abolish this modern day coal mine. I didn't choose the title. The issue here is that unpaid internships are anti-meritocratic and ultimately they're bad business. What you're- well, what, One at a time, anti-meritocratic how? Well, what you're really looking at when you talk about unpaid internships is a system where people whose families are wealthy and can afford to have their children work for no money over a summer while not they're going to them. college. Oh, not no, all of them. Well, not all of them. There's always, there are always going to be exceptions. I, I had interns, so one who worked as a translator. Sure, uh, there are always going to be exceptions. But the fact is, it's going to be much harder for that person, and many people aren't going to be able to do it. And what that means is, we're looking at a system where the people who are doing the internships, who are getting that leg up and the chance to get into the system, are the children of the richest. So if the rich can benefit more, it should be outlawed altogether. The fact is, what Americans want, for 100 years, Americans have said over and over again, what we want is workplace protections. That's why 75% of Americans say that there should be protections against employment discrimination Absolutely for sexual orientation. abrupt firings, and the result it's is why that more people are unemployed. And don't, people don't get opportunities this because is of why all these rules. Three quarters of Americans say that. I don't care what three quarters of Americans say. This is a say. democracy. Why don't you care? It? What? That's tyranny of the majority. Of it's, a million it's idiots. Not, that is not something. That is not tyranny of the majority. What you are talking about is democracy. Democracy is a system where people vote on what they want. And America is a liberal democracy, which means we have certain rights to protect minority groups. Maybe I'm just an old geezer who doesn't understand. Let's hear from one of my former exploited, unpaid interns. This is Zoelle Mellenbaum. She recently got a paying job here at Fox after working for me for almost nothing. She got a job with Neil Cavuto, right? Absolutely. So I, did I exploit you? Was it... Uh, exploit you means give me a lot of valuable experience teaching me I didn't me a lot. pay you. I got paid, maybe not in money, maybe I didn't get a big check at the end of my internship, but I got so much more. What I got was priceless. I mean, it got me, it got me a job here to launch my career. Oh, but it just favors privileged people. You're, you were going to Wellesley. I, you're the privileged. I worked extremely hard to get to where I am. What do your parents do? My parents are a, a lawyer and a doctor, and I supported myself throughout my internship. All right, I understand they, they that. They did so not contribute at all. I, I honestly, I think, and we can probably all agree, you and I are pretty similar. We both went to private colleges. We both came from privileged backgrounds, and we both worked very hard. But the fact is, most people can't get a fellowship. Most people aren't like us. Most people don't come from a family that can afford to have their kid do an unpaid internship. We have had all of the advantages in life. And I'm not even saying, oh, let, it's let unfair. Well, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. If, if I were, if I were on, a company, if I were a company hiring, an, hiring an intern, I would be much more likely to offer that internship to someone who is questionably qualified, to somebody who came from somewhere that I wasn't, I wasn't sure of, to someone who didn't come from an Ivy League institution like you did. I would be much more willing to offer them that opportunity to rise up if it didn't cost me anything. That's what I do. Right, I understand, company. but the point so is that those anything, people- So these internships allow mobility. They allow people to come up who who might not be so qualified, who might not be so educated to come up and have the opportunity to learn, which is what I did at my internship and why internships. All right, we're, we're not gonna solve this There's here. Thank you, Zoel and Raphael. Coming up, Common Core, plus popular nonsense from politicians. I will keep taxes low. You will bring peace and stability to the United States. It's time for us to change America.
who decides what your kids learn in government schools? States have had different rules. That has an advantage. It allows experiments so we can see what works better and what fails. School can adjust to what it teaches, just what it teaches to meet local needs. But that's supposed to change. Politicians in 45 states approved something called Common Core, the same goals for math and English, the same tests. It's a movement to standardize what's taught. They're like a total sea change in education. Consistent, strong, clear benchmarks for English language arts and math. Sounds like a good thing. With one set of national tests, we'd know what all American kids have learned. Everyone would be held to equal standards. However, lots of people on the left and the right are furious about Common Core. Lindsey Burke of the Heritage Foundation calls it a power grab. What do you mean? It wasn't imposed from the federal government. The states agreed to it. It's hard to say it wasn't imposed when you had billions of dollars, $4.35 billion, a non-trivial sum, offered to states in the form of grants, if and only if, of course, they agreed to adopt standards that were common to Tax a significant number of states. That's right. And now you have waivers from No Child Left Behind. This is incredibly valuable for a, a waiver state. from no only if you adopt Common Core. So there are federal fingerprints all over Common Core. I think it would be very difficult for any objective observer to say this is totally voluntary and totally state-led. Suggested reading list, EPA regulations. Yeah, yeah, and I think there's um, how to make a brown bag on that as well. Healthcare costs in McAllen, Texas. Really exciting materials for uh, your ninth grade student to be reading. Um, Education Secretary Arnie Duncan said opposition to Common Core comes from white suburban moms who all of a sudden, their child isn't as brilliant as they thought they were. I'm not surprised that opposition's coming from moms. They are seeing their children's homework come home. This Common Core line homework, Common Core line tests and quizzes that their children are taking, and they have so many questions. Indiana has just exited Common Core. Basically because two mothers wrote op-eds, called their local radio stations, wrote into newspapers and said, what we're seeing our kids bring home is total nonsense. And in fairness, these are not national standards. Their states chose to do that. But uh, here's an example of one of the few things we do know about the national Common Core math rules. What do you get if you multiply 11 times 23? Kids in third and fourth grade are supposed to use something called the area model. This video explains it. I know that 11 is equal to 10 plus 1. First, I know that 10... Now, I think it's clever that they use a child's voice and these drawings to try to explain math, but come on. This is 11 times 23. A fourth grader should be able to solve this in seconds, but the video goes on. 3 is equal to 30. Now we have most of our rectangle filled in. And on. And our bottom portion here. Everyone has to learn this way? Times 20 is equal to 20. Even more kids will go to sleep and at school. Finally, we fill in our last area and we say that one. That's a great example of why we're seeing schools send home Common Core cheat sheets to parents because they don't understand the way in which their children are being taught math now. And one of the cheat sheets I thought was uh, really laughable. It said, well, you used to call your kids homework word problems. Now they're math situations. The comedian Louis C.K. tweeted out, my kids used to love math. Now it makes them cry. Thanks, standardized testing and Common Core. Uh, and certainly nothing much good has come top down. But Common Core has received support from lots of people I respect. F former Florida Governor Jeb Bush, Michelle Rhee of Students First, Bill Gates, his foundation gave $170 million to Common Core. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce helped pay for this video. As teachers, we're on the front lines, and we support Common Core. Common Core is not some Washington mandate. That myth gets an F for misleading. Maybe you're, you just don't like change. <laughs> well, I would argue uh, to all of the proponents that the type of uniformity that Common Core or national standards creates assumes that there is one best way for children to learn, and it assumes that we know what that one best way is. But every child is different. Every child has unique learning needs. And I think what we're seeing with Common Core is a standardization of mediocrity. Standardized mediocrity. Thank you, Lindsay Burke. Coming up, 
that bestseller about income inequality. Why is it so popular? And also video games that gross even me out. I do think at a certain point you've made enough money. Have you made enough money yet? What is enough? It's a big issue today because income inequality has increased, mostly because some rich people got really rich, and our president is not happy about that. Those at the top have never done better, but average wages have barely budged. I believe this is the defining challenge of our time. The defining challenge. Is it? We libertarians say if people are free, some will get much richer than others, and that's just part of freedom. If markets are free, the rich don't get rich at the expense of poor people. Often the rich get rich by creating wealth that helps the poor. Nevertheless, the wealth disparity is big. The top 1% holds more wealth in America than the bottom 90% of the country combined. Take the heirs of Sam Walden, founder of Walmart. None of them founded Walmart. None of them were created equal either. The six of them have more than $140 billion in wealth. And it's money that keeps growing. That's a big point economist Thomas Piketty makes in his new book, Capital. Piketty's book has been number one on the bestseller list for weeks. Piketty suggests a wealth tax plus an 80% income tax on rich people. I'd like to interview him about that, except he's a French economist. His English isn't so good. So let's talk to Mike Consul of the Roosevelt Institute instead. It's a left-wing think tank, and Mike says a wealth tax is a good start. But libertarian economist Mark Skousen says taxing capital is a terrible idea. Why? Capital is the key to economic growth. So why would you tax it and tax it even at higher and higher rates? So uh, Because the Walton kids didn't earn it. It doesn't matter. The money is being used for investments, for expanding uh, uh, different products and so forth. And uh, it, when you destroy that wealth through taxation. And where is the money going? It's used for boondoggles, government wars, and so forth. Who knows where that money goes? Or it may even right, go... Well, the Roosevelt Institute would have it go to poor people, I assume. Yeah, you can do all kinds of stuff with it. Healthcare, education, a richer, more broadly prosperous society. Well, that would be against nice that? if the money would go there. But unfortunately, it is going to the welfare class. It is creating a dependent class that is very destructive. Yeah, and Mike, one of the about, reasons, let's John. Let's talk about that. What, well, there, there's two separate issues. What, what, what the government does with the money is, I mean, we have a broad commitment to making sure people have education, health care, safe retirements. I assume you're in favor of growth. You're in favor of creative destruction. Right. Um, you know, right now we're in a situation where most of the growth in our economy is being captured by the 1%. Um, you know, you see this. But it's not the same people. I mean, Oprah went from the bottom to the top. Sure. So did Sam Walton. He well, was a farmhand. And let's just talk about the products. Take Steve Jobs, one of the 1%. What did he create? It's what every one of us have in our pockets. We have a smartphone. And wealthy people, poor people, everybody have this. This is a great equalizer. Mm -hmm. And capital of the 1% is going into products like this that is helping everyone. So why would you penalize that? I think there's serious problems here with this book. One, for example, he says the rich automatically, automatically get richer. And that is so much baloney. There are so many examples. He uses the Forbes 400 riches list. Those people are changing constantly. You know, a basic compounding interest means if you have a lot of wealth, unless you're going to spend a lot of it or unless you're going to be kind of a waste Why girl. Why is it a problem? Well, it, part of it is, is just the legitimacy of capitalism. I mean, if, if, we are, if capitalism is not generating, a, a lot of reasons people like capitalism isn't necessarily this kind of liberty, libertarian, frontier argument, but that it's the best system we have for generating broadly shared prosperity. If that is becoming less true going forward, if we see much more income going to capital owners, if we see a super managerial class that you know, captures a huge amount of the innovation we make in our society. But you're not focusing on the average uh, worker who who is uh, having difficulty finding a job and so forth. And the reason is, is because you have these redistribution schemes that are taking all this money and giving it to the poor and creating a dependent class of fourth generation welfare recipients. This is a travesty in America. Why is it a problem if the top 1% get filthy rich if the poor do better 
too. And, and income is up. This graph shows it, that it's way up, 230% of the past 30 years for the top 1%. But the lowest quintile, income was up 50%. Sure. Well, there's a lot of reasons we might be worried about it. One is that as the 1% becomes much more rich, they'll dominate politics, they'll dominate the economy. Um, Piketty talks a lot about examples from the late 19th century where people weren't so interested in becoming innovators. They were much more interested in marrying rich, or they were much more interested in you know, finding a way to become a, a, a rentier and not necessarily becoming the person who starts the next startup that may or may not become rich. You know, one of the interesting things about his book is he points out, he takes his 200-year history and he says the only time when inequality and the gap shrunk between rich and poor was war and depression. And you don't want war, you don't want depression, <laughs> so why would you want to Mike, change the inequality issue? On that note, none of us want <laughs> war or depression. Thank you, Mike and Mark. Next, kids spend hours playing violent video games. Did you know that this turns them into killers? More popular nonsense coming up. on FX. Want to be horrified? Watch some of the video games that kids play these days. Though if you have young kids in the room, you may not want them to watch this. Call of Duty lets kids be soldiers. Counter-Strike lets you be a terrorist. Manhunt shows you how to strangle people and break their necks. Postal lets kids behead their enemies. The producer wouldn't let them show this. And the bestseller, Grand Theft Auto, invites you to be the bad guy. Stop shooting people, you maniac! It creeps me out to see kids playing these games. So what effect do they have on the kids? Whenever there's a mass shooting or some other violent crime, people say violent video games inspired it. Jack Thompson has said that so often and forcefully that video game lovers made this parody. I'm scared, man. I'm telling you, the world is turning into Grand Theft Auto. What are you saying? I'm saying that Jack Thompson was right. I need your help, Jack. Jack the Hammer Thompson, born Cleveland, Ohio, graduated Vanderbilt, middle of his class. Did you need my help six years ago when I sounded the alarm on these murder simulators? Filed his first lawsuit against GTA in 1997. No one would listen. Well, we'll listen to his popular nonsense and plug his book, Out of Harm's Way, One Man's Relentless Crusade to Save Your Kids from Video Game Madness. So... You don't have any evidence. You're making this stuff up. Oh. It's, it's logical, but... We got a, we got a ton of evidence. Uh, the American Psychological Association has done at least three studies that talk about the uh, deleterious effects of violent video games on the entire teenage population, some of which become more aggressive in their speech, some of them less empathetic, some of them go over the edge all the way to violence. 200 scholars signed a letter to the Psychological Association saying the relationship between the games and aggression has not been proven. The Supreme Court called the research unpersuasive. And, and countries that play the most video games have less crime. There's less teen violence these days. It's more well, video games, violence is going yeah, down. Yeah, but John, what you assume is all factors being static in that situation. What, what you have in America is decreased teen violence across the board. Yeah. But you have more of these spree killings and mass killings than ever before. No, spree killings are not up. It's just they, more reporting on no, them. No, John. We, we so didn't Sandy have any hook is caused by a violent video game? I think Adam it is Lanza? in part. Let me tell you what the governor's study of Connecticut found. They found that Adam Lanza had dozens of violent video games in his possession, which one eyewitness said he would play uh, all day and all night, including Grand Theft Auto, including he, Call of Duty. He played them, but the, the report also said his favorite game was Dance Dance Revolution, uh, which he played four to ten hours at a time. Well, fine. Ten bu Ted Bundy may have liked strawberry ice cream. That's not to say that strawberry ice cream had any factor in it at all. What he did consume were three different Grand Theft Auto games. Call of Duty, these games have figured in other such incidents. You can impart killing skills to someone 
who wouldn't otherwise have those skills. That's why the U.S. military... I'm sure it makes them better killers. It does. But they don't go kill. Well, they did in Paducah, Kentucky. Michael Carneal, age 13, I represented the six parents of those three girls shot and killed there. Well, you have plenty of company in your beliefs. There are Fox commentators who believe what you say. Uh, Ralph Nader said video game makers are electronic child molesters. I would say that the video game industry, Take Two, for example, that makes Grand Theft Auto, mentally molest minors for money. I met with the chairman of Take Two, Strauss Zelnick, and I said, I'll tell you what, I'll drop my criticism of you all if you simply agree to stop marketing and selling your games to underage kids. And he said, no, we'll destroy you rather than do that. Uh, he said he'll destroy you? Yes. And he, and he did vocationally. I'm no longer a lawyer. Uh, because well, you're no longer a lawyer because the Florida Supreme Court took your license away saying you ab abused the process of the court with constant and abusive and numerous meritless filings. No, I wasn't disbarred for that. I was disbarred, the order says, for appearing on 60 Minutes at the request of Ed Bradley to warn the American people that something like Sandy Hook was coming. When you would sue, you'd sue everybody. The I wasn't retailer, disbarred. the marketer. The yes, that's what any good tort lawyer would do. You sue any of the people who are responsible for the links in a causation chain. Republican Senator Lamar Alexander agrees with you. He said this about violent games. I think video games is a bigger problem than, than, uh, than guns. And after last year's Navy Yard shooting, left, uh, lefty TV host Ed Schultz said this about Grand Theft Auto. If you're a parent and you allow your son or daughter to watch this, even if they're beyond 18 years old, you're a lousy parent. Well, so, get, yeah. Really? 18-year-olds who can actually go to war shouldn't be allowed to play them? The standard, well, I'd say if you acted out Grand Theft Auto in Afghanistan, you'd be court-martialed and jailed. Because in Grand Theft Auto, the bad guys kill the good guys. They run over people with their cars. They have sex with prostitutes, right. John. Right, it's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. We've got generations of teenagers filling their hearts up and their souls with violence in which they do the violence, which makes them more likely, some of them, to act it out. Thank you, Jack. I just want to remind you, violence, teen violence, is down, though. So. He says it's for other reasons. Next, more very popular nonsense. Things will get done in Washington. It's time for us to change America. I'm a skeptic. I don't think astrologers can predict my future, that government-run health insurance can be both cheaper and better, or that banning video games will reduce violence. I get the appeal of these ideas. People want simple answers, but that's popular nonsense. The most dangerous nonsense is the belief that when there's a problem, government is the solution. There's a gasoline shortage largely created by government's price controls. Politicians then promise and bring us closer to energy independence for our country by 1980, by 1985, in 10 years, by the year 2025. Give me a break. There's no shortage of energy today because individuals discovered new supplies of oil and gas. They did it by overcoming government obstacles. Government central planners have failed most everywhere in the Soviet Union, in Cuba, at the post office, and on the Obamacare website. Yet despite all this failure, when another crisis hits, the natural human instinct is to say, government's got to do something. I will keep taxes low. This was the moment when the rise of the oceans began to slow and our planet began to heal. I cannot wait for this man to be president. <laughs> At first, when Obama supporters shouted, yes, we can, they spoke as individuals working toward common goals. Fire George Bush, help the poor, employ people, invent things. Individuals do those things, but government can't. Now, most people today at least have come to understand that this president can't fix everything. But the truth that's harder to grasp is that no politician can. That's why I wish more people would learn some economics. Nobel Prize winner Frederick Hayek wrote that the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. 
Politicians cannot design a better world and they fail when they try. But individuals can and do. It's why I wrote this book to give modern examples of how governments fail but individuals succeed. This is a counterintuitive idea. Most of us struggle to run our own lives. We're busy. We can't pay attention to everything. We're grateful to politicians who offer to take charge. After all, they're so interested in our welfare. It's all they talk about. Some even went to Harvard, so they must be very smart. It's logical to believe that they should plan our economy. People believe them when they say, yes, we can. But this belief is popular nonsense. Government creates new problems without solving old ones. But again, to say no they can't does not mean we individuals can't. We can. Recently, individuals invented lots of new ways for us to learn what's nonsense and what's not. Many of these services are completely free. All are better than what governments have offered and all of us are better off because this entrepreneurship from individuals brought us more choices. We will have more and more of that if government will just get out of our way. That's tonight's show. See you next week.